I am standing here on this stage this morning because when I was eight years old, an opossum wandered into my backyard. Now, as you might uh, surmise, there have been a couple of steps between there and here. I grew up on the west side of Rockford, Illinois. It is a space that is known for lots of different things. What I can comfortably say is that wildlife sightings were not typically one of them. Uh, this is the kind of space where uh, on any given day, I would be thrilled if there were some sparrows, a robin, maybe a squirrel. And so you can imagine my surprise when one summer night, my dad is taking out the garbage and he shouts for my mom and sister and I to join him. Something's going on. We walk outside and perched a matter of a few feet away on a top of a six foot tall cyclone fence is an opossum, the first one I'd ever seen. I didn't know such a thing existed. I certainly didn't know it existed in my own backyard. The opossum was not as excited to see us as I was to see it. Uh, it was baring its teeth, it was hissing. It was, doing, it was very much not playing dead, let's say. And eventually, after maybe 30 seconds, it, it wanders down the fence line and into the darkness. I walked back in the house with my family that night exhilarated. It was a moment that, even as it was happening, I knew was important. I can look back now and reflect on that experience and recognize how important it was. I can look at the ways that my behaviors changed as a result of it. In the short term, all of a sudden, I was really excited about taking out the garbage. Not because I was particularly excited about chores, but because all of a sudden, I lived in a place that had opossums. I lived in a place that had possibility, where I could, on any given night, see something that I'd never seen before. For years following that night, uh, every night before bed, I would turn off the light in my bedroom, and I would peek through the blinds. And I'd look out into the darkness in hopes of seeing that ghostly white creature or another one. I never did. But it turns out, in retrospect, that maybe it didn't matter. What I know now is that that night I experienced something called wildlife-inspired awe. After that night, I spent, I've spent my career trying to save animals, to save wildlife, to conserve natural resources, and to help other people do the same. I did so for years as an environmental educator, teaching kids about the natural world, and eventually was inspired to go back to school to become a social scientist, which is what I am today. Now, a social scientist is not a wildlife biologist. Uh, I don't study opossums specifically or any other animal. What I do study is people, and what I seek to understand is how people develop relationships with the natural world. And inspired by my own experiences, I wanted to make sense of how other people found wildlife important. As part of my work, I came to learn that emotion was often at the center of those experiences, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. Uh, but in most cases, when people remem remembered having an, an experience with a wild animal, uh, the word awe would arise. Awe has been well studied, and we know that there are lots of benefits to experiencing it. People tend to have greater ability to be resilient. They are more likely to cope with stresses uh, and to find satisfactory outcomes. They are more likely to be community leaders or be actively engaged uh, as a citizen. They are more socially involved. They tend to have wider social networks and overall tend to feel quite a bit healthier. Awe is thought by many to be a foundational human experience, something that is unique to us. It is seen as overtly positive and memorable. It is something that is, in fact, so positive, so overwhelmingly good, that it commits to our memories and almost scares us. So how does, then, this apply to wildlife? I tried to answer those questions. I do so by having conversations with people. And over the course of the last decade, I've spoken to probably several hundred. 
And as you would probably expect, the situations they describe can involve anything from soaring eagles to breaching whales. Things with charisma, uh, things that uh, would easily inspire people. What we also know, uh, though, is, and what I've seen experienced more times than not, is that when people tell these stories, they get to the end and they show gratitude. They thank me. Thank you for letting me tell that story. I've never told anyone that, or I haven't thought about that in many years. And of course it begs the question, well, why? More times than not, they would tell me no one had ever asked. And so with that in mind, I invite you to just for a moment close your eyes and let your mind drift. Drift back to the first significant, positive, memorable wildlife experience you've ever had. Think about where you were. Think about who you were with. What was the animal? How many of you can still visualize that moment? Chances are you experienced wildlife-inspired awe. Now, of the many, many people uh, that I've been fortunate enough to speak with over the course of time, uh, one of my favorites was a woman named Bernice. At the time that we spoke, uh, Bernice was 78 years old, and she was someone who I spoke with for hours over the course of several weeks. Uh, every once a week, I'd get an email saying, we got a talking and I thought of something else, and she'd send me a picture. Bernice, during our first interview, told me this incredible story. She says, you know, as a result of experiencing wildlife-inspired awe, I'm actually more likely to go to church. And as a researcher, my ears perk up. I'm like, yes, tell me about how animals helped you find religion, how now you believe in a higher power and you're more deeply spiritual. And she goes, oh, no, it's not that. Uh, but after church, we all go down in the basement and I get to tell stories about animals. <laughs> not exactly the breakthrough I was hoping for, but a significant one nevertheless, because we have an example of an aging adult who is now engaging in healthier, more social behaviors, all because she wants to tell people about her experiences. These are a couple of pictures that Bernice sent me. And some of them are something you'd expect, a bird alighting on her hand. Some are much less conventional, uh, the moment that she saw a rattlesnake strike a rabbit. They're very different experiences, and yet for her, both evoked a sense of awe. She was staggered by the power of the experience, and even without the images, she told me that she could remember those moments vividly. Bernice had traveled far and wide in an effort to see wild animals. And so it inspired me to ask the questions of people, where do you experience wildlife-inspired awe? And the two places, above and beyond any others, were our local parks and our own homes and backyards. Not faraway places, not places we had to travel to, places nearby, oftentimes close to our hearts. Why is wildlife special? It's my argument that from a very young age, we are inundated with stories of wild animals. From the time we are very young, animals are something that we use to make sense of what makes us human. They are the subjects of our stories. I don't know who told you, I don't know how old you were, but I know that everybody in this room knows who the big bad wolf is. I know that you know that slow and steady is going to win the race because of one very insightful tortoise. We know these things, and we can't cite our sources. We can't maybe pinpoint the moment that we learn those things, but those are messages that stuck with us. Because from the time we were very young, we were allowed to use animals to make sense of the world around us. There are lots of things that have the potential to inspire awe. Everything from athletes in architecture, to great orators, to natural settings, to sunrises, to sunsets, all of these things uh, have the potential to inspire awe. 
And yet, we are drawn to wildlife. So much so that in the U.S., we spend literally billions of dollars a year just to be in the same space with a wild animal. Any of you that know, those are very expensive camera lenses. We are driven to great lengths to get as close as we can. One of the things that has come out of the work that I've done is that there is a component of habit forming that occurs when people experience wildlife-inspired awe. In short, it feels so good, they want to do it again. Sometimes it's the exact same spot, sometimes it's the exact same animal, but more times than not, they're just more compelled to go out and adventure. Those who experience wildlife-inspired awe are more likely to participate in outdoor recreation activities. They are more likely to feed their birds. They are more likely to donate to environmental causes. They are more likely not only to recognize their place in an ecosystem, uh, but really reflect on it and make meaning of it. They are more active citizens when it comes to the natural world. By going out, by being in the out of doors, we know that people ultimately lead healthier lives. And I thought that, that Janie captured that particularly well. If more people valued wildlife, the world would have more joy and people would learn how to get along better. If you can get along with the squirrels in your backyard, you can get along with your nasty boss. When you have an actual close encounter with an animal, it changes you. You feel so awestruck that this animal noticed you. When you do all this, there's a lot more magic in the world. One of my favorite scholars, Joanne Vining, uh, spoke at length about the potential uh, magic that can occur with wildlife. And it's a feeling of awe and wonder uh, that can be encapsulated in plenty of brilliant spaces, scenic vistas, shimmering beaches. We oftentimes, when we think of awe, we think of the grand. But one of the beauties of wildlife-inspired awe is that virtually every landscape, even our own backyards, has wildlife. We don't have to travel far and wide. We can stay close to home. It seems overly simplistic, but if you can find a wild animal, you've found the potential for awe and all the good things that comes with it. Now, this is a journey that I've been on for a very long time now. And what I can tell you is that I set out to help people save wildlife. And in the last decade, one of the things that I've come to recognize is that wildlife is oftentimes just as likely to save people. When I talk about opossums, I'm not just talking about a single species. I'm not even just talking about wildlife. I'm talking about an idea. The idea is that we can be awed by the seemingly mundane that we don't need faraway places, that the little things, the everyday things, the things that maybe we don't always look up and notice can provide awe for us. All we have to do is peer through the blinds and look out into the darkness. If we don't do that, we don't find it. So I don't know what your awe-filled moment will be. I don't know if it'll be an opossum. I don't even know if it'll be an animal. But I know that it's out there if we're only willing to look. And so with that in mind, my wish for you is that all of your parks and all of your backyards have opossums. Thank you. <laughs>